Okay, I'll okay, call this meeting of the Ville Park Village Board to order. Today's July 22nd at 7 p.m. Uh, Clerk Kornecki, will you please call the roll? Trustee Silella? Here. Trustee Cazone? Here. Trustee Murphy? Here. Trustee Patrick? Here. Trustee Tucker? Here. Trustee Wagner? Here. President Wolfus? Here. Let's all stand for a pledge and then remain standing for uh, a short prayer. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Trustee Wagner has a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with your grace as we make decisions that might affect the residents, staff, businesses, surrounding communities, and all those that enter the village of Villa Park. And continue to remind us that all we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of truth, for the greater glory of you, and for the service of humanity. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the next item on the agenda is public comments on agenda items. If anybody from the public has a comment on uh, items 5 through 10, uh, yes. anybody signed up? Yes, John Nojewski for 10D. 10D? D, yes. Okay. I'm the president of Villa Park Youth Baseball, John Nojewski. Um, I think getting the lights down at um, High Ridge would be greatly improvement for the village as far as keeping kids in our programs playing baseball. Um, the older kids, we have kids that come out to play from the city and places like that, and it's hard for them to make it for a 6 o'clock game. So if we were able to have more than, you know, one game per night or for some of these towns to travel far away to get out to play by us would be greatly appreciated. Okay. This is just for application to apply for the grant. So we don't have that yet. Okay. So this is just the first step. Okay. Okay. Anyone else, clerk? Yes, uh, we also have John Langer regarding 10D as well. I'm also here to uh, discuss lights uh, at the uh, at the base at uh, High Ridge ba baseball field. Uh, my name is John Langer. I've been resident for about 25 years, and uh, I've been involved in youth sports for about the last 15 years and I think this would be a great asset for the city and I understand uh, bringing somebody in from design studios would give uh, Villa Park a greater chance to uh, to get the bid or to get the grant and uh, I'm very in favor of it uh, not only for youth sports but the, uh, by putting lights in and other uh, amenities uh, it would allow p potentially the park district to be able to uh, open up adult leagues as well, which I think would be profitable. Mm -hmm. As we, we've seen in Lombard, I've actually been a member of the Lombard 30 and over baseball league for about 13 years as well. And it's a great program. And if we could maybe uh, partner with them or open our own leagues, I think for the, those reasons, I think I'm very in favor of it. Good. Good. Thank you. That's all I have. That's all? Okay. Okay. Anyone else for an agenda item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on down to uh, amendments to the agenda. Do any of the board members have an amendment to the agenda? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll go down to the presentation on the uh, audit presentation from Brian LeFair. So, who's up, Kevin or Brian? Or both of you? Tag team. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have uh, Brian Lefevre. He's our audit engagement partner, or he's a partner with the the government audit section of SICH LLP. They've been in our auditor been our auditor for the last five years, and so he, tonight he's going to present our comprehensive annual financial report. It's got a really nice looking cover. I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, I can't. That's from Emily from the manager's office that put that together. But um, Brian and his team uh, were, have been out uh, doing field work, preliminary field work, and we've been talking back and forth for the past several months to uh, to be able to put together this comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, once the board accepts the report, 
uh, tonight. We will publish it on our website, make copies available at the library and at Village Hall for those that want to, uh, to take a look at it and read through it. But I'm going to turn it over to Brian to give some highlights of the financial condition for the eight months ending December 31st of 2018. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Kevin. On behalf of SICK, I'd like to thank the President and the members of the Board for inviting us to present some brief comments on the report resulting from the Village's audit uh, for the eight months ended December 31st, 2018. What you have is the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, within the comprehensive annual financial report, there's three sections, an introductory section, a financial section, and a statistical section. Within the introductory section, uh, page three is the award that the village received for its CAFR from the Government Finance Officers Association. It's the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And this is the highest level of financial reporting within the local government industry. You'll see that it's the April 30th, 2017 that received the award, which was the 31st consecutive year. With the village's change in its fiscal year, you'll see a note on, on page four, both for your purposes and also for GFOA's purposes when you submit the 1231, that that April 3018 was still under evaluation. Um, but in going through the, the program checklist with the village um, and with our team, we're confident that um, the village will receive the award for the April 30th, 2018 year end as well. Excuse me. Within the financial section, the first document in the financial section is the independent auditor's report. This is on Sickage letterhead. Um, this is where we give our opinion on the financial statements. In order for us to give an opinion on the financial statements, we're required to follow two sets of standards. One are the auditing standards, which are issued by the AICPA, the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants. And those, those standards tell us the types of procedures we need to perform when we're conducting our audit. The other set of standards are the standards from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or GASB. GASB sets the financial reporting rules for local governments such as the village. So the statements, the notes to the financial statements, all the content in this document is prescribed by those standards from GASB. Once we follow those two sets of standards, we can then give an opinion on the financial statements. We're pleased to present an unmodified opinion. And what that means is that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, those, those GASB standards, free of material misstatement. And this is the highest level of opinion that you can receive on your financial statements. So as part of the audit engagement, um, because you have TIF districts and because you had a certain level of expenditures of federal awards, we also were required to one was the TIF compliance audit. There's a separate document that is issued related to your compliance with the guidelines for the TIF. Um, and we've issued an unmodified opinion there as well. And any, in any particular fiscal period, in this case, in an eight month period with your change in fiscal year end, where you expend more than $750,000 in federal awards, you're required to have a separate compliance audit that's governed by the federal government. It's called a single audit of your federal expenditures. In that separate document, there's also two opinions given in that document as well. One is your compliance with major programs. And in this year, along with last year, the major program was your CDBG disaster recovery program. That was the, a, a large portion of the $1.2 million in federal funds that you expended during the year. And we gave an un unmodified opinion on your compliance with that major program. And then the other piece of the single audit is your over compliance with laws and regulations that could have a material impact on the village's financial statements. And we also issued an unmodified opinion there. So you should all be commended for that. Just past the independent auditor's report, you'll see the management discussion analysis. This is the executive summary of the CAFR. The CAFR is a very lengthy document. If you don't have a chance to read through the whole thing, I would encourage you to start with the management discussion analysis. It's written by the village. It's required by GASB. We review it to make sure it's consistent with those GASB standards and with the financial statement presentation itself. It's the one place in the document where you get to compare this year to last year and give some of the whys to the financial statements and the financial condition of the village. I would point out to you, for those of the that have hard copies of the report, on pages four and five, you'll see on the statement of net position, and it was also referenced in our independent auditor's report, there was a new GASB standard that the village was required to implement for this eight-month period. It was called GASB Statement 75. 
other post-employment benefits. Basically, it relates to your ret retiree health insurance liability and actuary determined that liability and it's been reported on your financial statements for the first time with this implementation. It's similar to when the net pension liability came on to the statements themselves a couple of years ago for your police pension, fire pension, and IMRF plans. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't change how you operate. It changes the financial reporting required by GASB to receive that unmodified opinion. <clears throat> the last thing I would point out to you is the operating statement for your uh, general operating fund, um, which you'd find on page 11. And that shows you the revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances um, for the eight-month period. And you had an overall increase in your fund balance for the eight-month period of 586000 leaving you with fund balance or reserves at the end of the at the end of the eight month period of just over nine million dollars. Um, as Kevin mentioned, the audit process goes for a number of months, um, laid out a timeline with with the village um, and the finance department plays a lead. We work with all of the departments of the village in conjunction with the audit and you should all know your, your staff are very professional. The, the audit went smoothly um, and uh, we completed everything um, on a timely basis. With that, I would turn it over to you and see if you have any questions. Okay. Any questions from the board? Jesse Tucker. Um, how many individual audits did you do? I mean, I counted four different mm, sections. I mean, you did an overall audit, I got that. But how many individual type audits from the three different, what is it, three different company type things we had to do? <coughs> right, so there's, there's, the, there's the financial audit of okay. the of the village, which is the compre in the comprehensive annual financial report, there's the compliance audit for the TIF, and then there's two compliance opinions that are issued on your federal awards and your single audit. So from that standpoint, you can think of it as four, four different, different opinions. I don't opinions, know if I call it four different opinions audits. Opinions or four different audits. Correct. And then I take it you do a line by line type audit for each one of them, and then bring it all together. Is that how it works? Yes. Yeah, so in any audit you test a sample of transactions throughout the year. We gain an understanding of your, of your checks and balances or your internal controls over all your key processes. And then within the, within the numbers themselves, the general ledger, if you will, we're testing certain transactions. And a lot of that is geared towards materiality, but it's also based on a risk assessment um, that we do with your input. We get input from you on the assessment of risk within, within the organization. And then we also, um, take other assessments of risk in the industry because we, we do a number of municipal audits and we, we apply that to the village as well. So you're doing comparisons when you do the audit? Are you doing a comparison from so other municipalities? In terms, of, in terms of assessing risk, so yes. if, there's a, if there's a certain area that, that we, we know is a risky area with a lot of governments, we're going to apply that knowledge as well as knowledge gained from the staff and from yourselves in terms of what areas might be of the highest risk here as well. And then we're also focusing on your high dollar transactions, your material transactions. Um, no one would ever do an audit where you looked at every single transaction for the whole year. No one, that's okay, just not nobody cost goes effective. line by line. You leave that to our, uh, Correct. Our staff to do that. Correct. Okay. The, the, the financial statements are the responsibility of the village. Okay. So it's our responsibility then to audit those financial statements. So are you doing a compare uh, more a comparison of when you look at our you're doing a compare to, to see how high of a risk we're compared to other municipalities? Is that what you mean by a risk statement? No, we're once we assess risk. That then tells us what transactions we should be testing. Okay. So we're looking at invoices. We're confirming bank balances. We're we're going through and confirming the debt payments that you made on bond issues. There's a lot of documentation that's provided by the village, and also that we gather from third parties to confirm those that information. So that tells you the areas that you should be looking more closely for to see if we've gotten that. If range you've recorded your transactions, transactions properly, properly, correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Now, maybe for Kevin, I, did we just get a new uh, bond rating too, or did the bonding houses just give us a new rating? I'm sure the the uh, 
this audit stuff gets sent over to them too, right? Sure, it does. Yes, we did uh, go through the ratings process for upcoming bonds that we're issue we are issuing uh, next month, and our rating was stable, double A stable outlook, which is good. Um, and they mm -hmm. do rely on our comprehensive annual financial report, so that is a critical part of it. Um, it's really great that we put together this comprehensive annual financial report as opposed to just the financial statements. It helps users such as the bond rating agency and residents and anybody that's doing business with the village or has an interest in the village to have a good understanding of our financial condition or financial situation. It's all in here. And so, um, so us being able to put together this full report with all of the accompanying information and not just the financial statements that, that really is helpful uh, from a transparency standpoint, but also to communicate to the bond rating agencies um, and those types of folks so that we can get the best rates uh, going forward when we're, when we're borrowing funds and that type of thing. So it's, it's really a, a great, um, it, it's a very good thing for us to be doing. Uh, and it, it takes more work on our side, but that's okay because it, it pays off uh, dividends in the, in the way, um, with uh, a good bond rating and having good communication of our financial condition to, to anybody that is actually interested in that. Because I did read, read over the uh, rating, uh, uh, one that we just got, and it's a very good report for them too, so. Yes. Yes, and we've had double A for quite some time now. For quite some time, yes. Yeah, so that helps us in the interest that we pay on those it bonds. Sa it saves us money yes. over the long term. When we're borrowing millions of dollars, mm -hmm. every percentage point that that, that, that we're paying money. lower is lots of savings over right. the next uh, decades. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any comments? I just uh, like to thank you and your team for doing an excellent job and keeping us on task and um, hope to continue that. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It's a it's it's a pleasure to to work with Brian and his staff. I'd like to thank Brian and all the folks at Sickich and. Definitely want to thank all of the departments, especially Public Works, but every department really puts in a lot of work. Uh, sometimes I ask them to drop whatever they're doing to get us some financial reports or some information that we need. And the Finance Department, we definitely appreciate that. And as I said, uh, the support of the, the board and the village manager uh, put it so that we can put together these good reports. Um, it, it's mm -hmm. critical to have good infrastructure, good technology and infrastructure, and good people in place so that when it comes time for the audit, uh, we get good results with stuff like this. So mm -hmm. it's an investment all year round. So. I know in my prior life I have put up with some uh, audit teams, and uh, it's a lot of work, and sometimes it gets a little frustrating <laughs> when you get your regular work to do, plus you have yeah. to answer all the questions. So but thank you for that. So thank you for your work. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to item number six, and we have the uh, appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, 6A is the Planning and Zoning Commission, Robert Whitehurst, for a uh, term of uh, one year. Just, just so um, you guys know, Robin had been, has been on the Planning and Zoning Commission for 26 years, mm -hmm. and uh, his work schedule has gotten kind of... Um, uh, overloaded at, at his work so um, he has stepped down as the chairman of the planning and zoning commission he had been the chairman for a number of years and jason jarrett is taking over that position and robin agreed to uh, finish out the term of linda bellows who left the commission during the due to personal reasons and this, and then for one more year to see how his schedule uh, frees up if he's able to continue or not so that's why he has one more one year appointment to fill, finish out the uh, term of uh, Linda Bellows, who uh, had to leave, and Robin's term was up at the end of last at the, in, in uh, April. So, and then we also had the Fire and Police Commission, Mary Ann Bolster, for uh, three years, 2019 through 2022. Do I have a motion for the appointments, Trustee? Well, I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll Trustee second that Wagner. motion. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, roll call vote. Okay, Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Salella? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. <coughs> Trustee Cazone? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. President Boltis? Yes. Item 7 is the consent agenda, bill listing for the week of July 8th and July 15th, 2019, 
in the total amount of one million four hundred and seven thousand seven hundred forty seven dollars and eleven cents and we have the minutes from the board village board meeting held on july 8th 2019. we have a motion for the consent agenda trustee wagner i'd like to make that motion trustee tucker second yes i would second that okay any questions seeing none roll call vote please okay trustee Cazone. yes trustee salella yes trustee murphy yes trustee patrick yes trustee tucker yes trustee wagner yes president Bolthus. yes Item 8 is the first reading of an ordinance to be codified, and um, this is the first reading of an ordinance with Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, adopting a new traffic study guidelines. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. Traffic studies are an important component of property developments. Traffic studies evaluate existing traffic volumes and patterns along adjacent roadways and estimate traffic changes which may result from a proposed development. This information is critical in designing site plans that promote safety and minimize traffic delays. Village staff has prepared updated traffic study regulations to better ensure that new developments can function adequately without safety issues or additional traffic congestion. Public Works and Community Development staff request that the Village Board approve the ordinance adopting these new traffic study regulations. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, this is a first reading, so we don't need a motion. This is just for discussion. If any uh, board members have any questions or comments about this issue, um, any concerns, now is the time to bring those up. Trustee Ciela. On traffic study, does that include placement of stop signs where current stop signs aren't existing? <coughs> is, is, is that part of that study? It, it's not. Uh, I don't believe so. We've got Rich Salerno. Generally, it has to do with new developments. So, Rich Salerno is going to fill us in. The president is correct. Um, it, it's for new development, uh, but traffic stop signs are looked at uh, under what the uh, configuration under the manual on uniform control devices. So they take a look at like if there's a, a warrant for stop signs, possibly uh, needs to have equal um, volumes of traffic in both directions. A traffic stop sign can't just be placed at, at a whim. There's a specific guidelines to follow. I just didn't know if this fell under this category or not. Um, this actually, this is for the whole development to be looked at. So it's looking at turning movements. Um, obviously, depending on the size of development and the proximity, it can look at, at, at traffic control devices. Okay, thank you. Traffic and Safety Commission requires a lot of, not traffic and safety, uh, <coughs> planning and zoning if somebody comes in with a new development. They require uh, a lot of times a traffic study, mm -hmm. and that's this is sort of what that falls okay. under. See where, if we can accommodate them with the traffic. So. Trustee Wagner. I just want to note, and it's noted in the in the memo that this was discussed at the Traffic and Safety Commission, and they uh, voted to pass it on to the Village Board. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee Tucker. Um, speaking of that, when we have new development, aren't they paying for a traffic safety thing? What's the difference between this and what you're requesting in the past years past uh, with the old traffic guidelines the village actually paid for the traffic study this study here now allows in the developer to pay for that traffic study and being brought to staff to, to review that so we're switching over because I know we were somewhere in what is it 2016 we had somebody review this 2016 is when it was reviewed and that we had KLOA a traffic study firm that they've actually provided numerous traffic studies for the village in years past but it dates back to 2007 mm -hmm. was the last time that this was updated so since 2007 any larger development it was the burden on the village for the traffic impact study so is this an update from what 2007 is? That Are is we correct. using what he recommended in 2016 in this new study? That's correct. So okay. this is an update from 2007, looking at current conditions, now looking at things holistically, many, many different aspects of, for the development and the size of the development. It also gives a little bit more leniency when a traffic study <laughs> is required or what they have a traffic assessment for a lesser development. So it's basically an update for what we had in 2007 you're doing with this study? Is yes. that what that's doing? Okay. Anyone else? 
Okay, seeing none, we'll move this on to the, our, our, our next meeting, our next agenda <laughs> item uh, in August 12th. So, all right, we'll move on now to item 9A, which is the second reading of an ordinance of the Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, increasing the number of D-1 full package convenience store liquor license for the package sale of alcohol beverages. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. Johnson's Villa Park, Inc., doing business as Johnson's Lighthouse Point, located at 1 West St. Charles Road, has requested a Class D-1 full package convenience store liquor license. They have successfully completed the background check. The total floor and cooler space dedicated for the display of alcoholic liquor is limited to 20% for Class D1 licenses. Johnson's Lighthouse Point will dedicate 16% of the convenience store floor space. This calculation excludes the space for Subway, Dunkin' Donuts, and the adjacent seating area. With the approval of this license, along with agenda items 9B and 9C for Bulldog Ale House, and Ardmore Station Liquors, there would be a total of 64 liquor licenses. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Do we have a motion for the, uh, for the ordinance? President Trustee Bothus, Wagner? I'd do like to make that motion. Do we have a second? second. Trustee Cazone? I'll second that. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, roll call vote. Trustee Salello? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Tucker? No. Trustee Patrick? Uh, yes. Trustee uh, Wagner? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. President Bolfus? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, with that, it, it passes, and we'll move on mm -hmm. to number 9B, which is the second reading of an ordinance of the Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, increasing the number of Class B liquor license for package sale of alcohol beverages. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. Ardmore Station Liquor is located at 405 North Ardmore is being sold to the owner of Sri Sharar Corporation. The new owner would like to take over the liquor license and has successfully completed a background check. This license would replace the existing business class B package liquor license. With the approval of this license along with agenda items 9A and 9C for Johnson's Lighthouse and Bulldog Ale House, there would be a total of 64 liquor licenses. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Do we have a motion for the ordinance? Make Trust a motion. Okay. Second? I'll second Trust that. Me. Okay. Murphy, okay. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Trustee Cazone? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. Trustee Silella? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. President Bolthus? Yes. Okay, number 9C is a second reading of ordinance of the Village Vill Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, increasing the number of class I, restaurant, sit-down bar, unrestricted license. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. The owner of Roosevelt 100 Court, Mr. Ametti, doing business as Bulldog Ale House at 100 East Roosevelt Road, has requested a Class I restaurant, sit-down bar, unrestricted license. He has successfully completed his background check. This is the space previously occupied by Outback Steakhouse. With the approval of this license, along with agenda items 9A and 9B for Johnson's Lighthouse and Ardmore Station Liquors, there would be a total of 64 liquor licenses. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Do we have a motion for the ordinance? Trustee Cazone? Mr. President, I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Trustee yeah. Murphy? Okay. Any questions or comment from the board? Seeing none, roll call vote. Trustee Wagner? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Silella? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. President Bolton? Yes. Okay, item 10 is a resolution of the Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, amending the Village's military active duty leave policy. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. The Illinois Service Member Employment and Reemployment Rights Act was amended this year in order to provide a framework for employers regarding pay and benefits for military reservists called the active duty. This resolution will amend the village's personnel manual to bring our policy in compliance with these changes in state law, specifically regarding village employees that are called the basic training, annual training, voluntary training, or active duty deployment assignments. Thank you, Your Honor. Do okay. you have a motion for the resolution? I'll make that motion. Trustee Patrick, do I have a second? Trustee Wagner? I'll second that motion. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, roll call vote. Trustee Salella? Yes. 
Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. President Boltus? Yes. Item 10B is a resolution of the Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, approving the purchase of three new police squad vehicles in the total amount of $102,427. Manager Keenan. Thank you, Your Honor. The police department utilizes 14 squad cars for emergency response and patrol duties. The rotation plan includes the replacement of three squad vehicles annually to ensure all squads remain in proper mechanical condition for emergency response and patrol duties. The police department recommends the purchase of two Ford utility police interceptors and one hybrid Ford utility police interceptor at a cost of $102,427. Funding for the purchase of these vehicles will be divided between two funding accounts. Two vehicles will be funded through the Equipment Replacement Fund account number 65502024401 in a total amount of $66,108. The remaining vehicle would be funded by DUI Fund account number 19502004402 in the amount of $36,319. Thank you, Your Honor. Do a motion for the resolution? President Bolthus, I'll make that motion. Patrick. President, I'll make the motion. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion. Trustee Wagner, okay. Um, any questions or comments? Trustee Cazone. Uh, I just got one, one question on it. Um, you know, the article is, is actually a good article about the performance standards of the, the hybrid. But do we, is there a, a difference in maintenance costs on the hybrid versus the, the standard interceptor? Maybe uh, Chief uh, Lake can uh, help us with that. Uh, good evening. At this point, we're not real sure if there's going to be a difference in maintenance um, costs. I have had several conversations with uh, the fleet manager, and one of the things that he did advise me is that uh, of one of the vehicles we have in the fleet, it's a hybrid we've had in the fleet, not for patrol, but for the village for um, 10 years or so. And he said the maintenance cost on that has been very little throughout the course of the, uh, the life of that vehicle. Good. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Trustee Patrick? No, yeah, Patrick. Uh, Murphy. Right here. <laughs> oh, oh, <that's> right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I need a little bit of help understanding this program being new to this. If we're replacing three cars every year, am I correct in suggesting that we have no patrol cars that are older than five years old? We may have some. I don't have the, um, the whole fleet with me. Okay. Um, but what we do, for example, in this case, uh, one of the vehicles that we're going to be getting rid of and replacing that vehicle with is a Tahoe 2010 ta uh, Chevy Tahoe with 150,000 miles on it. So that's going to go to auction. The other two vehicles are 2014 Explorers. And by the time we get to that point, um, right now they've got about 83, 85,000 miles on them. They'll be between 90 and 95,000 by the time we get these vehicles on the road. But those vehicles will be transferred over to Public Works. Public Works then, and again, this is in uh, conversations with the fleet manager, has two vehicles they're going to be getting rid of for auction, a uh, 2006 and a 2010 Tahoe. With, uh, they each have about 160,000 miles on them. And they're all former police vehicles. Do we have any insight into what our neighboring villages are doing? Is this like a relatively traditional program that most villages do? And do they use the same type of timing or mileage in their recycling? Or we're not familiar with it. I don't know specifically what the other villages do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I believe it's pretty similar to the other villages. You have to keep rotating them out. So, and then we don't. We still use them in other departments. So. I noticed that the fire inspector could maybe use a different car. <laughs> so, Jesse Wagner. Um, I likewise would like just to uh, applaud staff for going with uh, at least one hybrid. I, I hope that, uh, and I realize the uh, that we want to be cautious and want to make sure that the vehicle performs. But I think there's plenty of um, history in other communities that have uh, not just hybrids, but other they have. Some have electric vehicles, some have compressed natural gas, um, and they, they seem to perform well. So I hope that maybe with our next purchase, maybe we can do all hybrids. I think it would be a great thing. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee, because I just want to maybe possibly shed a little light on mileage on your vehicles aren't also uh, the only thing you take into account. It's the idle time, the hours of. Yes non-movement uh, 
be it accidents, fires, whatever. Right. There's a lot of hours put onto those engines that yeah. don't total up between, on your Studies say between four and six hours of vital time right. for eight-hour shift. Right. So miles isn't yeah. the only aspect of replacement. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Tucker. Um, I'm just requesting to um, have a list of what's happening because you didn't give us a list that the Tahoe is going 2010 Tahoe mileage, um, both the 2014. What did you say? Uh, oh, I can give that to you. And where they're moving to. Could we have a list of where they're going to? Sure. Um, so that we know one's going to auction or where, where, where we're moving it around in the department on doing that. Um, when do you estimate these new vehicles are going to be up in service? Because we still haven't moved the equipment. I know we have to move equipment. And when do you expect them in to get we, them actually There's been service? a delay because of the hybrids coming out this year. So nobody has, um, police agencies or very few have gotten uh, been able to receive 2020 for interceptors, whether it's the regular gas engine or the hybrid because of this, this changeover. So we're hoping we can get our order in and get them hopefully out on the, the road by the end of the year. So we're hoping by December possibly to have yes. it up and rolling. There's a little time that, that after we get them, you have to put the cages in, right. you have to uh, uh, put the radios in and all the computer stuff. Well, you so. got to switch things over. Yeah, put the lights, you know. And all that I just didn't know if we were going to have them up and running in 2020 or before then. Hopefully that, before then. Okay. Well, it's in this year's budget, so. Well, we'll I understand that, but that doesn't budget. mean we have them up and running <laughs> in time. <laughs> we'll have them. Okay. We'll have the vehicles. Yeah. But. Anybody else? Okay, roll call vote, please. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Salella? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. President Bolkus? Yes. Item 10C is a resolution of the Village of Villa Park DuPage County, Illinois, approving the purchase and installation agreement of a high density evidence storage solution uh, with Bradford Systems Corporation of Bentonville, Illinois. In the amount not to exceed $33,255. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. The Villa Park Police Department currently maintains five internal evidence vaults within the police facility. As of May 2019, these vaults retain in excess of 38,000 pieces of evidence. Three of the five vaults are at or near capacity. The existing shelving and storage units in the vaults were originally constructed in 2005 and are largely inefficient for maximizing the use of the space. An updated evidence storage and shelving unit would increase vault capacity by approximately 300 cubic feet. A bid was provided by Bradford Systems in the amount of $33,255 through the National Intergovernmental Purchasing Alliance to provide and install a new evidence storage and shelving system. <coughs> Funds for this expense will be taken from the Building Improvement Fund account 67 5020402. Thank you, Your Honor. Do I have a motion for the resolution? Trustee President, Patrick? I'd like to make the motion. Do I have a second? <coughs> Trustee Wagner? I'll second the motion. Questions or comments? Trustee Tucker. I have a question. On the um, system, we it looks like we requested or they requested five hundred and fifty dollars to paint. Could we not paint it ourselves? <laughs> Andrew Keener? We could. Yeah. <laughs> think that was in the floor portion yes okay it was when it all gets installed they're going to be doing a lot of construction through the flooring including adding um, the rolling mechanisms for the shelves roll back and forth and then what they recommended was it's not just painting the floor it's it's a protective sealant paint which will be non-slip and will also help protect against anything that may fall there's a lot of substances that we bring into the vaults that uh, you know have a potential for um, you know falling on the floor or opening up and we just so want to make sure we protect everything with putting you know this amount of money into it we want to make sure it's done right and and lasts for a very long time so it's a different type of a painting yes. system we're speaking of that we couldn't do ourselves um the other thing is i noticed that they estimated per shelf level my understanding is the levels were all the same but um they were talking 350 for does that overall for the five different shelves they're all the same height that they're talking about or individually the 340 I believe it's for the whole shelving system itself the whole sh for the ba backdrops because they only mentioned uh, u3 and u4 where the u2 and u7 were 
from the drawing were all in the same unit, but they were only talking about the middle two units having the backstop. So I'm like, okay, what's happening to the other two on the outside Well, the, the two ones? on the outsides are stationary. They're going to be stationary? Yes. Okay, so it's only the, th uh, well, you, you had five moving units. Right. So <coughs> the far outsides were the stationary ones, but you had five in the middle, and from the drawing, they were only using the two in the middle they were talking about, not the two outer. I would have to review that further because it's okay. my understanding. <laughs> that's, well, that's what I wanted to know. I mean, are we paying the, the 350 for the for the back stops on all five of the shelvings? Because they only mentioned in the, in the your, uh, request U3 and U4, where if I'm correct on looking at the picture, U2 and U7 also moved. So he didn't mention it in there. I'm like, okay, are we doing it for all of them or just the two center ones? Well, the, the, uh, the price they quoted was for the installation of everything to, to the specs that they need to be done so yeah okay so it was for all the backstops Correct. for all those moving shelves then and not just okay because in the description they only had the two sections I'm like okay what do we do with the other ones that they're not putting backstops on I have a couple questions yes they did uh, mention in your in the backup material a wall that should have been taken down and hadn't been taken down the increased the size of the room correct is that wall going to be taken down now yes and they're doing that too or is our staff doing our that? staff is going to be doing that okay and just for everybody's knowledge when you get some evidence in a case how long do you have to keep it <laughs> see now I remember when I first got I was amazed it's like forever as far as you know so is there a certain time limit or does this you got 38,000 pieces and some evidence we have to keep indefinitely for very serious <laughs> crimes such as homicides or uh, <coughs> sexual offenses and then it goes down the line based on the statute of limitations and the severity of the offense so some we do have to keep forever and and that's one of the things that's caused this is shortly after we moved into the, the building we had a series of some major cases and we all of a sudden compiled a bunch of evidence that, that we have to keep forever and need to be able to store it properly and the only way you can get rid of that is if the case is over if I write the, the judge you have to have a judge okay it, it, it yes you have to have a, a permission to destroy right. yeah do we have any old cars that have been sitting around forever <laughs> <laughs> we actually do <laughs> that's what I thought mm -hmm. so and they were here a long time when I got here so and I think there'd be some way to get rid of those so but uh, they're across the street. We were able to get you rid of those in the basement them. over there, did you? <laughs> <laughs> we were able to get rid of two of them by uh, by judge's orders, but the other ones remain. Make a guess. How long did we have them? How long did we have those cars before we could get rid of them? We've had long a before your time. Right? I couldn't even tell you. Yeah, yeah. Haven't we had a problem with a car recently that they wanted us to release? Or the owner wanted us to release? No. 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 Yeah, there's, there's some old ones over there, so maybe some antiques. So, yep. Okay. So, you know, just so everybody knows, you know, he wants a lot of space, but you get that stuff, you just can't get rid of right. it. So, it's like sticks like glue. Yep. So. Good. <laughs> Quick question. And some of these, like, really old cases, are you allowed to store them off site? Like, can you get storage facilities, or does it have to be, you it know, would have protected? to be a very secure facility that's under, um, you know, camera mm -hmm. surveillance yeah. and. Um, very limited access because I know there are departments that do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. You always have to be able to prove the chain yeah, of sure. yeah. usage. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yep. Anyone else have any questions? Seeing none, roll call vote. Okay, Trustee Salella? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. <coughs> Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. President Boltus? Yes. <laughs> Item uh, 10D is a resolution of the Village of Villa Park, DuPage County, Illinois, uh, retaining 3D design studios to complete it and submit an open space land acquisition and development OSLAD grant application for ball field lighting and storage uh, for High Ridge baseball field and of course cost not to exceed $5,950. Manager Keener. Thank you, Your Honor. The Parks and Recreation Department and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission would like to provide the residents of Villa Park and children who participate in the Villa Park Youth Baseball League with a new lit baseball field at the soon to be completed High Ridge Road baseball field. An Oslot grant would assist the village to light the field <coughs> 
and provide storage and concessions at the High Ridge Road baseball field, which would produce a second high quality field where night games can be played. Receipt of this 50-50 grant would obligate the village to a maximum of 250,000 of the $500,000 estimated total project cost. Approval of this resolution approves the village to utilize the grant application services of 3D design studios in an amount not to exceed $5,950, paid with contractual services account 36502022299 if awarded funding for the project would be budgeted in the calendar year 2020. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have a motion for a resolution? I'll make that motion. Trustee Cazone? I'll make that motion. Second? I'll second. Trustee Stella? Okay. Any questions? Comments? Trustee Murphy? I have a, a couple comments and two questions. Right now, from my perspective, it's feeling premature to be discussing spending parks and recreation money prior to having gotten the delivery of the feasibility study results. Uh, one of the th issues that we have to deal with is that it's my understanding the grant is due by August 19th and the feasibility study is scheduled to be delivered, I believe, around the 13th. So that would present a challenge. Um, my perspective is $500,000 is a lot of money, whether half of it's ours and half of it's a grant, but that's a large sum of money to be spending without the results of the feasibility study. If we were to entertain that alternative, I would prefer to see it at a multi-field location as opposed to a single field location. And I don't know what the feasibility of that would be. Uh, the questions that I have are, was the lighted ball field on High Ridge Road on the Parks and Rec master plan? That's my first question. And the second question would be, Based on the fact that we haven't been delivered the feasibility study results, is anyone familiar with sightings within the feasibility study of residents requesting a lighted ball field? Because to the best of my knowledge, I'm not seeing any. Yeah, here he comes. Uh, good evening. Uh, Villa Park Youth Baseball. Um, we had some discussions with the youth baseball commissioners and they would like to see a lit field. There's really no other multi-field space within the village to light fields. We have, except for District 45 fields, we even looked actually at the possibility of lighting some fields over at Jefferson. It was just the way that the fields are configured, it's not gonna work. Uh, as far as the master plan, uh, I can't recall, I'd have to uh, double check on if lights were actually discussed in that, but we did talk about uh, renovating that field. Are you seeing resident input in the feasibility study requesting a lighted ball field? Uh, might have to check, the, to be honest with you, I'd have to go back and review. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> did you see any when you read the report? No, I didn't see any either. So. No. Uh, but yeah, remember, this is just $5,900 to see if we can get a grant. Right, but so. then it's suggesting that we would be suggesting we'd be moving forward with the possibility of $250,000 for a $500,000 mm -hmm. lighted baseball facility. I would have to be educated on what that is comprised of. That seems like an extreme amount of money. We had buildings full of people crying over losing their swimming pool, and now we're talking about perhaps two entities that are interested in spending $500,000 on lighting a ball field. It's, uh, it's, ch it's a challenge for me at this point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Trustee Patrick? I would. Um, first of all, I would like to say that the uh, Villa Park Youth Baseball League is awesome here in Villa Park. It has really, really come a long ways. <laughs> um, my son uh, has been playing baseball there for two years now, and actually one of his coaches are right up here in the front row, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, the Youth Baseball League offers our kids awesome opportunities on how to learn teamwork, um, how to play as a team, uh, how to win, how to lose. Um, my son, first year played, uh, they won a championship uh, and he got a huge trophy and that just boosted his confidence so much. Um, I am definitely in favor of being able to um, help out the Youth Baseball League and improve our baseball fields. Absolutely. I, I believe it's long overdue and, and well deserved too. Um, I hope that in the future 
at our long-term strategic planning meeting on October 5th that we include our fields as a part of um, one of our priorities in, in helping maintain the Youth Baseball League as well. Um, I will um, piggyback off of Trustee Murphy's concerns, though, is that um, I would like to have some answers as to whether or not it is in the feasibility study um, and how we uh, go about um, having some um, some uh, answers to our questions and um, going forward hoping that again this remains a priority for us and that our kids get the opportunity to experience what they're already experiencing in the Little Park Youth Baseball League so thank you just just as a review with a feasibility study it was mainly focused on is it feasible to provide a recreation community center in an outdoor pool so the focus on the feasibility study there was community input on what they would like to see within the community and we'd have to check on their input as far as their suggestions uh, but the feasibility studies main components were rec center and the uh, outdoor pool and program one uh, one question Programming. one question that I do have for you too is who maintains the baseball fields we do parks and rec uh, okay parks department. is there ever a uh, a time period in which uh, we stop maintaining those fields um, we mow all the big fields for District 45, and the baseball fields, we stop maintaining the baseball fields once the fall leagues are over. Once the fall leagues are over. Correct. So, yeah, but uh, we do maintain, we, then we switch to soccer. So a baseball, soccer. Field, a baseball field this size, uh, according to being a, a nice, uh, what are they, the, uh, a high quality field, as it says in here, require certain maintenance baseball fields do that's mm -hmm. correct am I, am I right on that sure um, so I want to make sure that if going forward we're going to be spending this amount of money on a baseball field a high quality baseball field that we're able to maintain it properly um, I was at uh, Franklin Park two days ago and was able to see a picture of that field uh, my son was also playing a baseball field on that in May and two months later, it, the entire infield was grass. So I think it is important that if the village decides to spend money on things like this, that we have a plan in place that helps maintain those fields properly for the longevity of them. I totally agree with you. And, and the representatives from Youth Baseball can probably attest about the quality of fields that they received this year. Um, and they're not even our, we don't own the fields. We maintain them for District 45. And it's rather challenging, um, but uh, we, we, I'm going to toot my own horn for my guys. They do a, a pretty darn good job maintaining that field. So it's not going to be something where, you know, and in the fall season or late, late fall, you're not going to maintain the field. You just have to spruce it up when does, springtime comes. Does District 45 own Franklin Park field? Franklin Park? No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, does? Franklin Park, right. So, but there's, we, own the, we own Franklin Park, and... Um, yeah, once those fields are out of commission, then we, we focus on other things throughout the village. Okay. Going forward, though, the new ballpark would be owned by us. Correct. Correct. So we could maintain it to the highest standards. Sure. Yep. Okay. You bet. Anything else? Okay. Anyone else? Trustee Wager. Thank you, President Pultis. Um I heard some of the discussion at the Park and Rec Advisory mm -hmm. Commission meeting on this, but uh, just a question that I have is, were there any other projects that were in the running to submit for a grant? I mean, was this the only one that we decided upon, or was there anything else that was considered? The um, uh, word came down on June 11th for that the Oslag grant and the new session uh, was uh, going to commence July 1st through August 19th. So there was nothing other planned. This was current renovation of the fields, and there was there had been previous talk about lighting that field. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Trustee Witt, Tucker. Okay, um, I just want to intervene on the Park and Rest Advisory Committee. They did have a discussion about this, and some of their suggestions were if we did get the lighted field, that it would turn into some type of a multi-purpose field so that we could use it throughout the year for the soccer 
for football practice field on the back of the outfield. Um, they had a discussion of uh, possibly a mobile uh, pitching mound that could be moved or not moved so that we could use the field when it is not used for baseball season. So that was brought up. Um, the ma master plan, the lighting field was discussed. When we were going through the parks, um, we made a comment about lighting that field. We also made a comment about Twin Lakes field, possibly lighting that field in the future um, when money became available or the way it came about. Um, due to the fact that most of our fields we can't light because of the residency, um, the two fields that we did make a discussion when we toured the park was <laughs> Twin Lakes and high ridge field because they were the higher fields um, due to the fact all we have is lions and we wanted to be able to move um, possibly other um, night games to other fields and we didn't have the ability to do that so it was discussed um, previously I don't know can't put it in the master plan if it was actually there but I know that was discussion was put up because we discussed the outside field on that, on whether we could move it back. Um, we had a discussion on concession stands being put over there when plans were put into effect. Um, there's been some discussion on when they were making the floodplains, how they were gonna maneuver that field if we were gonna lose it or not. And some of this, uh, because of District 45, if we could join uh, the layouts of the fields to something else with them. So there has been several discussions um, with the park and Rec advisory board on this. So they are discussing it. So it's not just thrown into the field. Um, when it was brought to them, they did approve this idea. So they did back it as a recommendation that they thought it was a good idea to move forward for our future. Was that voted on? Yes, it was. They recommended they, it to be done. There was a done. recommendation. So it was it a was recommendation. Not voted on, it was they they um, supported. It was a support it was from it. Yeah, that's all they can do. Is that's make all they, a recommendation. they can't actually vote to do it. They could. They made a suggestion and they supported they make it a to be moved forward. And then it comes to here. So. And, and just to take along, um, this year being the rainy weather that we had, I think there was 89 rainout games. So there's another issue with youth baseball trying to get their games in, and this would allow them to at least get a, a couple more games in in, in the evening hours. Um, the Warriors football program practices out there. Um, they could potentially use the outfield grass as a practice location, especially in the fall when you know the clock turns back and uh, there's less daylight hours. So it's an opportunity for youth football to, to practice and even soccer. So. And there's a potential actually to gain more revenue if we wanted to do a, um, the adult baseball leagues are really uh, popular now. And they're always looking for places to play. Trustee Wager. Will this uh, be able to eliminate the, the sled hill? Will sled hill's there? still there. That that's the, uh, we'll leave that up to Rich Lerner. No, will it be able to illuminate it? Oh, illuminate oh, it, I'm yes. sorry. Uh, no, there's really no, um, I thought you said eliminate, sorry, uh, Trustee Wagner. Um, there, there's no bleed over and the okay. new the systems now and we'll have uh, community input meetings um, prior to the application going in um, but there's no bleed over okay um, I, I would imagine we could maybe change the lighting around uh, I'd have to check on that so. okay thank you you're welcome anyone else okay roll call vote please okay trustee Patrick yes trustee Wagner yes trustee Tucker yes Trustee Murphy? No. Trustee Cazone? Yes. Trustee Salello? Yes. President Bolthus? Yes. Okay, item 11 is public comment on non-agenda items. We'll start with anybody who had signed up, and then I'll ask for anybody else after that. Yes, first one I have is Amanda Bailey. Good evening. Um, so I'm here to obtain a class double E liquor license for Mays. Um, I currently work with Mays Lounge, but we're opening a new location called June's Villa Park. Um, 
I'm sorry, what was that called? June's Villa Park. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're still June, right? June. Okay, May, yeah. June. Okay. May, June. Okay. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> why they came up with that concept, but apparently it's going working for them. Um, so I know we already have a location that's currently being built right now. We've already attained our liquor license for the um, Mays Villa Park location currently. Um, now I'm just here for another location. Um, currently the shopping center that it's uh, 70 East North Avenue is where we already um, are, have obtained the lease. Um, and it's currently 80% vacant in there. I believe there is a Great Clips in the HR block. So I think it would add value to that area too. And then also we're still maintaining our luxury brand and hospitality. And then our, um, we're hiring employees dedicated to that particular branding as well. Um, so the job um, with the build out, it's we're gonna put 250K into the renovations just for that particular build out. And that's mm -hmm. all usually always what we spend on build outs and we have multiple locations. And then there's about 30 to 50 jobs going f just from the build out too. And then s about five to eight uh, full-time long-term employees, part-time to full-time. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to obtain currently. So I, uh, Amanda, right? Yeah. She called me um, a number of weeks ago about wanting to open a gaming facility. This is a strip mall that's being built in front of the Target on North Avenue. And I uh, told her that uh, I wasn't comfortable to make that decision on my own. So she asked if she could come to the village board to see what uh, if they'd be in favor of uh, her being able to get a liquor license so they can have a video gaming facility on North Avenue in front of the Target. So basically, she's here looking for guidance, and so am I. So, <laughs> so you know, if you got any questions or any um, concerns, we can't, you know, vote on anything to uh, uh, approve this, but uh, just so we know which direction, direction we should to go. go. Yeah. So, Trustee Cazal. Personally, I think the board has in the past kind of been shying away from gaming facilities, especially strictly gaming facilities. Um, yeah. I think we've heard it from the uh, residents of Villa Park that there's enough gaming <laughs> facilities in Villa Park. Personally, I would not be in favor of it, okay. but I don't know about the rest of the board. How many do we have in that area right now? Do we have any within a certain circumference of that area? I know we've got a couple on the other side of town. There's a Stella just down the street in front of the um, uh, shopping center yeah. by the, by the uh, White Castle. There's a Stellas. Yeah. So, Trustee Wagner. Um, I can't express an opinion at all because I couldn't hear you at the beginning of oh. your remarks. So I didn't know what you were talking about. Uh, I kind of got the idea as you rolled along. But um, I kind of had the same feeling. Uh, this is news to me. I don't know anything about your facility is, except what I kind of was able to hear. So uh, I can't express an opinion at this time. That's all. Thank you. Did I understand you to say you have one location that's open already? It's being built currently. Um, okay. It's in um, the preliminary stages. We already have obtained our liquor license and um, our gaming license, actually. So I, um, our, my owner, this owner of the company, wants to kind of build a stronger presence in Villa Park and then a bigger presence in the community as well. So that's why. But it's not to a point of being able to go look at it? No, not okay. yet. The uh, one that he have right now is in the shopping center where the Outback was, okay. Outback Steakhouse. Yeah. It's over there. So they, they mm -hmm. just got that license uh, a month or Yeah, or like a month ago. ago. Yeah. So. so anybody else have any questions? I have one more. Yep. Are you leasing your spaces? And if so, what are what the terms of your leases? Are they long-term or short-term leases? 
They're long term. It depends on the lease because every lease is different. Mm -hmm. So normally, um, it's it's always five years or greater. Um, it depends on the owner and what they want to negotiate to, and then the price as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if the uh, board doesn't have any more questions, would you please uh, get back to me this week if you would be in favor of them uh, having a liquor license so they can open a uh, another video gaming store establishment on North Avenue in front of the Target. Can you remind me again what type of liquor license they're hoping for? A double E. Yeah. Which double is? E. It's a restaurant, unrestricted restaurant. Okay. And what are your hours at those facilities? So it varies. Um, so it's 10 a.m. to um, 12 a.m. Um, Monday through Friday. And then it's actually on Sundays, or actually Monday through Saturday, it's 12 a.m. We always close at 12 a.m. And then on Sundays, we close at 11. So it's 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there's no other questions, just get back to me this week so we can give her some uh, direction. So, okay. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank I appreciate you. Appreciate it. Yeah, do we have any else? Yeah, signed Joe up? Omori has the report to uh, give us. Good evening, Joe Omori, 309 East Maple Street. I have a couple of items that I wanted to bring to the board's attention. On uh, Saturday, the 20th, I attended a meeting at the DuPage Rail Safety Council. A uh, representative from the Illinois Commerce Commission was there. And uh, in regard to the proposed uh, pedestrian crossing at Ardmore Avenue, the fund that uh, supplies that money, he said, is flush. And there is an un unrestricted uh, costs, but their portion is only going to be 60%. He said that the balance has to be on the application, has to be identified for the rest of the funding, but not necessarily secured. <coughs> So the, 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 um, but he also <coughs> mentioned that it would, you know, that it's imperative that the application get put in. Uh, the other thing was that um, I've talked to other sources and they've said that the design phase has to be, um, cost has to be covered by the village. So I uh, hope that we could reach out to our, our state representatives, Tom and, um, Deb and see if they might be able to help us out with at least funding the design phase. In regard to the uh, crossing at Ardmore Avenue, I noticed uh, recently that uh, signs have been erected approaching the crossing. It says, um, if stopped at the railroad crossing for longer than 15 minutes, please contact the Union Pacific Response Management Communication Center and it gives the two hotline numbers. Uh, I'm not sure who erected these signs because it didn't have any village markings on it. Um, it's not a bad idea. Uh, I don't it, know whether or not that's going to um, allow them to move that train because usually response management uh, has nothing to do with operations. But if these signs are going to be helpful, then they, we should have them erected also at uh, Addison Road and Villa. And another item that was discussed at the meeting uh, this Friday, the 26th, the Union Pacific is going to be operating their steam engine, the 4014 Big Boy that was featured on the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, on May 10th. Uh, traditionally, these uh, train movements bring out thousands of onlookers. They uh, Propose this uh, locomotive is going to with with the train cars that uh, it operates with are going to be um, departing the Butler Yard in Milwaukee around 8 a.m. It operates south into Elmhurst and then it's going to operate from west from Elmhurst to West Chicago. The proposed arrival time is 2:30, but these things never operate on strict schedules. So I'm not. I will call into uh, the UP representative Eric Perella today. Um, to see if they had and planned on putting any um, press releases out, not only advertising the um, the movement of the train, but also advising of the safety aspects of people who want to view it. The um, their website advises 
for people coming to see the steam locomotives in person, stand back at least 25 feet from all railroad tracks, railroad tracks, trestles, yards, and rights of way private property. Please do not trespass and never assume tracks are abandoned or inactive. Always expect a train. So I was hoping that they would put these safety tips in and whatever press releases they have advertising the train movement, but he didn't get back to me. So just uh, as a matter of fact that they should, uh, if you could advise the police that there may be a lot of trespassers, people out during the course of the day to observe this movement. It's on the 26th, right? That's on Friday, the 26th. Okay. July. Okay. Yes, this Friday coming up. The, um, the second item was in uh, the proposed um, reroute of the pace bus. Mm -hmm. So I did a couple of uh, proposals, three different options. I hope I made enough copies if you wouldn't mind. Give them to that's the proposals are basically identifying all of proposed stops that these routes can make. But to be brief, one, starting at North Avenue, I mean, starting at St. Charles and uh, 83, the westbound route would go north to North Avenue, west to Ardmore. South, this is option one, to St. Charles. And then from St. Charles, it would continue on Ardmore, pick up the existing route at Washington, go west to Westmore Myers Road, then south on Westmore Myers to 22nd Street, and then down into the, uh, proposed, the, cur the current route to end up at Yorktown. Option two would maintain the first part of that option, but at St. Charles, it would turn and right and go west on St. Charles to Main Street Lombard along Parkside to so it would stay south of the tracks then south on Main Street to Roosevelt, east on Roosevelt, I believe it's Highland, and then uh, south to pick up uh, from 22nd Street to Yorktown. The, um, the round trip times are compatible with both the current and the previous routes and also allows for a 15 minute driver comfort stop at Yorktown. In my observation, there's too many potential business, industrial, residential um, customers to count. But it was suggested to me that we should be able to want to provide pace with ridership projections. That's their responsibility. They have the, the network for doing that. They have, it's, it's, they have the people and the assets to, to do ridership projections. But because they never took down the previous route signs, I'm afraid that once the, 20, the, uh, the bridge construction is completed, they're gonna go resume the old route. And this is, again, an opportunity to improve service to residents and businesses in Villa Park for both residents and uh, visitors. The last thing was that um, option three would be like a hybrid where it would go incorporate one option and then return on the second option. That to me, I think, is the least desirable route because it it doesn't take into account. Uh, well, it doesn't allow people who want to do round trips. Like for example, if somebody wanted to use it to get to and from the train station, they would uh, they'd have a difficult time going, you know, getting back to where they started from. It would be possible, but it would take much longer. I think option two would be the best option because you could utilize that as a as a, ripe, a bypass route, if there was Metro had a service disruption, people could still get in or, in or out of the city by using the, the ground transportation provided by CTA and PACE. So the, uh, that's all I have. If there's any questions. Okay, the other thing was that uh, it was advised to me that um, by one of the union representatives that uh, nothing is going to happen without the cooperation of Lombard. And since both these route their options incorporate Lombard, that it's, they need to be brought in on this. But when I was one thing I wanted to add, when I was going over Ardmore Crossing the other day, the crossing is pretty rough. So if you know of any uh, plan to redo that crossing, then all this is not is going to have to hold until that crossing renewal is completed because you can't use Ardmore as a bypass and then shut down for a week while they, uh, you know, while they renew the crossing, okay? 
All right, anything else? Questions? All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else signed up? No, I have okay. no one else. Anyone else like to? Uh, please come up to the microphone and state your name, please. Sign in. And sign in. I, I think there's a pen up there. Yep. Hi, my name is Anton Logan or Lohanenko. Wait, wait. Sign in first and then. And then speaking at a microphone. Uh, Hello, Council. My name is Anton Lohan or Lohanenko. Either way is fine. Uh, I use the shorter version uh, for American and for Eastern Europeans as the longer version when I first came to the United States. Um, I'm going to approach the Council right now, if that's okay, with some pamphlets. Okay, yeah, give them to the clerk. Okay. I hope I made enough files for everybody. Uh, they are for take home. Um, we started, uh, I think everybody got an email uh, about the Villapar Boxing Club and the uh, UTAG. Uh, this is the reason why I have made this pamphlet for you guys to have more familiar about our program. I know we were maybe kind of in the dark ages. Nobody ever heard of us because we've been priding ourselves on uh, self-sufficient and not asking any government for any help. Uh, and we've been running our program. And I'm actually third generation myself. If it wasn't for this program, I don't know where I'd be today. I have uh, a state's attorney actually at the time, uh, or a pallet court judge, uh, Joe Brickett and uh, Carol Sound. She's died today. To, uh, she will not be also be able to present. So I, it's in my hands now to take this over, and I am the president of this 51C3. Uh, I, like I said, I put, uh, I put in a, a, a most recent, we have to, we're number three in the country. We just took a bronze medal at the national level for the Junior Olympics in boxing. Uh, and uh, the person that actually wrote a letter is this father. Um, uh, the kid's growing up without a mother. And this is some of the outlook, some of these short stories of an outlooks how uh, our boxing youth program has been um, creating and changing lives. I, I know three minutes is very short time, and that only, it's almost time to say hello and goodbye at the same time. This is the reason why I have put in pamphlet and brought uh, our treasury with me to have an extra three minutes um, that can tell you about maybe about my story and how I, this program has changed my, my life. At certain, I went to York High School here when I first came to the United States. I actually went to Tr uh, Churchill Junior High at the time. Uh, I didn't speak a word of English. I know it's changed now. I uh, went to cadet school at the, uh, at the National Guard. I, I utilized a lot of that military aspect of it into our program too. So, um, any questions or concerns, uh, and uh, if you want to ask me now, please do. And that way, maybe I can tell how can you help me, and how can we help uh, also uh, to grow our youth program too. Um, first, I, if I may, first yes. of all, um, I just want to commend you and your organization for being able to uh, do what you do for underprivileged kids in the neighborhood giving them some activities to do and give them a purpose. I commend you, uh, especially with your efforts to try to not take any kind of handouts from um, any kind of government, ent government entities or so forth. Um, I, I commend you on that. S keep up the good work. It's not always easy. Most definitely, especially if we've been doing this since the uh, late 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Trustee Wagner, did you have something? Thank you. Um, how many kids do you have in the program? It varies, to be honest with you. Right now we have 22 signed up. Uh, last year I had about 40. The year before was 37. I got about 1-5 ratio. I am not, um, I may be very nice in front of you, but I'm very short-tempered. And uh, the reason being, um, I'm not a nice coach. Um, I don't have time. I have a newborn baby. And the only way I can uh, help somebody if they want to help themselves. So uh, I, we work directly with DuPage County as well. We take a lot of kids that uh, can't pass any drug tests or whatnot. We have some success actually in 2016. I went have a kid go on a national level as well um, that couldn't pass a drug test at 15. <laughs> So and was 250 pounds after just three to six months of my program, he was down 158. So that's I think it's a big deal. So this is just some of the remarks. Go ahead. If we wanted to come and look at your program, when do you when when do you have? Uh, it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday between six and eight. Uh, I hope you do it in the last uh, in the next month till this time first because we might not be around afterwards. That's the why we have we are approaching the council today. 
Um, so you're in the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church? Correct. And we, ha like I said, we have been there. Uh, s uh, and also uh, Joe Brickett, Joe Brickett is an appellate court judge now, has also approached uh, the pre uh, pastor uh, about us staying there. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have reached out in that. Um, sadly, Carol Sanders has passed away, so she will not be able to do that mm -hmm. for us. But um, at this point, that's what you we You know, have. I called the pastor over there, too, and the facilities manager. Um, they weren't going to. They they weren't interested in extending your time over there when I talked to them. So my question is, what I know our Patrick uh, Burke from our uh, community development I think has also talked to you. Yes. Um, wh what are you requesting us from us? Uh, if there is anything you can do with the church, and uh, at, at this point, this is the only thing that I was asking. If there's anything you can do with the church, uh, please do. Um, at this point, I have not much uh, concern because honestly, we haven't asked for any funding. If any funding is possible for us to maybe go elsewhere, sure, we maybe uh, maybe in the considerations. At this point, I'm not asking anything, uh, any handouts or anything else. If that's possibility for us, yes, thank you. If not. The w I'm, I'm mm. uh, only thing I'm asking for is for us to stay where we at, because anyways, this program I've been because of how sanctuary this was for me. I have uh, extended my pocket, and this program been running out of my own pocket for quite a long time. Mm. So if we move more elsewhere, uh, and I will have to do considerably the same thing. I'm, I am not interested. I will definitely be closing because again, <laughs> it's it takes a lot of, a lot of toll on you too. Yeah, I. I didn't get anywhere with the pastor for you, so sorry about that. Um, so, have you looked anywhere? Well, you're looking for some place where. I, I have definitely have looked. Like I said, at this point, if uh, any council have suggestions uh, and any fundings that we have may not heard of, anything that's programs that uh, maybe uh, mm -hmm. or places or anything at all, like uh, yes, that we okay. definitely would be. Uh, you, everybody, I think, has my email at this point. I have reached out to everybody with the letter that I have approached uh, the council. I know there may be some spelling errors time because I was typing it on, on, the, on the stairs right before the meeting took place. So I, <laughs> I apologize about that because the English is not my second language. I mean, not my first language. I speak five, uh, if that matters at all. But yes. Okay. So if anybody up here has any ideas of Trustee Cazone? Uh, a couple. Have you approached uh, St. Alexander's Church? Because uh, no, they have a gym, and you know, with the school down, they may have some openings there. Please There's email me uh, directly. Uh, yeah. I think uh, you have my email directly. Please okay. email and me. And then also, have you talked to John Ryan with uh, Catholic Charities? He's, no, I he's big with um, with boxing. Somebody who give me some context. I have contact okay. a couple of, uh, a couple of different places. Whoever contacts what I was given, I already contacted them. So if there any yes, any more, please okay. email me directly. I will definitely contact them and see if that could be helpful. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. you, also can, you might also contact York Township. Uh, they do have a youth advisory commission. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some significant space in the township hall. That's wonderful. Uh, they might you might consider contacting them as well. I will definitely, and if you can possibly maybe uh, guide, guide me in the right direction who to talk to over there uh, and email me that, I would sure. I would be very considerate for that. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anton, I will continue to help you find a location. Thank to, you. To further support your mission. Thank you so much. And I'll step. Now, if I when I talk to the uh, church, you know, if he finds another place and he can't get in there by September first, they're willing to discuss. Uh, extending that date so excellent okay all right anybody else okay so if you have any you got his email yeah it's on this. okay yes. hi good evening my name is Danita Politica and I'm uh, affiliated with Anton I was actually one of his coaches many many years ago and it would really be a shame to see this program go down the tubes I mean, in the 27 years that I've been associated with this, my husband and I, we've probably had hundreds of children go through the program. Um, we do have some success stories. I mean, a lot of them we have. I know of one that is now working for uh, TSA. We did have one that is in the military, or was. And he uh, went on to become a Golden Glove champion for the military for the Army in North Carolina. So there are success stories here. And we have helped a lot of the young people. It is a youth outreach program. And it would really, really be a shame to see it just 
fall apart. And Anton came to us when he was mm -hmm. 15 years old, came to us with black eyes and a very vicious temper. And uh, when my... Beat it at him, huh? Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> Punch it at him. <laughs> when my uh, husband and I decided to retire from it six years ago, we were just going to let the club go. And because my children are no longer interested in it, and Anton came to me and said, no, you guys can't do that. You guys saved my life. When I was 13, 15 years old, I was new in the country, bullied, no friends. I came to you guys. You guys helped me out a lot. And consequently, he feels that we saved, literally saved his life from who knows where he would have wound up. But <laughs> again, um, I know it sounds like we're asking for help, and technically we are. I mean, if you have a community program that we could fit into, that would be great. Um, I know boxing is not necessarily as popular as baseball or football, um, but it is still a sport, and, and there are young people that are interested in it. And it does build self-esteem, and it does build confidence. Um, and we do have certain things that we maintain. I, I know when my husband and I ran it, the children, they weren't children, they were kids. They literally had to maintain a C average or they could not be in the club anymore. We did not take community funding for the very simple reason that we did not want to have gang bangers allowed in because gang bangers' parents pay taxes. So that way we were able to kind of control um, the element that came in. So uh, again, I, if you have any other options for us, um, if the church is willing to let Anton stay for a, at least a temporary period of time, that would be much appreciated. And I appreciate your time and listening to us as well. Thank you. Okay, please sign in. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So well, yay. You know, you, you have all these these guys here, and everybody in the audience heard it, and people at home uh, got it on TV. So um, if anybody at home has any ideas, just uh, feel free to contact the village, and we'll uh, get the path that you. on Thank to you. Thank you very much. So, okay. Thank you. Anyone else on a non-agenda item? Okay, seeing none, we'll move down to the trustees report. We'll start to the <coughs> right. Clerk's oh, clerk's report, report. Uh, number 12. Okay. <laughs> I don't have, what? Gee, you don't no, have anything, right? Thank you, thank you, clerk. Yes, I do not, not tonight, okay. thank you. Okay, <laughs> trustee, uh, trustee uh, Patrick. Sure, absolutely. I just wanted to um, say thank you to Chief Kosnick uh, this afternoon. I was. Uh, given a tour of both of the fire stations and uh, I just want um, to know that um, we back you guys 100% uh, you guys are out there every day um, putting your lives on the line for us so I thank you Mr. Uh, no report this evening Don't? there's a couple things uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. is a community pride commission meeting uh, 6 o'clock here uh, right in the room next door on the second floor um, always looking for commissioners um, I think we need one or two more on there uh, but six o'clock tomorrow Community Pride Commission and um, the Economic Development Commission has um, started the Yes Villa Park website uh, it's been up for a couple of months now and uh, it's starting to get a lot of good hits and we're trying to get in uh, different businesses uh, highlighted each month now so uh, it's called it's yesvillapark.com and it's got some interesting articles and uh, a lot of businesses in Villa Park. So, and that's it. Trustee okay. Wagner. Thank you, President Pultis. Just a couple things. I um, want to let members of the public know that the Environmental Concerns Commission will be meeting here at Village Hall at 7 p.m. Uh, this coming Thursday. Um, I also want to let the members of the public know about a program that will be coming up. On Tuesday, uh, August 27th, at the Iowa Community Center, this is a program that uh, we're doing with CUB, and it's um, it's uh, they call it a solar hour. It's, it's being done all across the region, and the object of the meeting is to educate people on uh, installing solar panels in their homes and the uh, rebates that are available. Uh, so it's it, it's it's one part of it is to educate people. Uh, the other part is that um, in the end of September, Cub will be putting together a group of people who are interested in installing solar panels, uh, and they're going to do a group buy. So uh, this is just to educate people 
and then to see if they're interested in, in, in participating in the program. So it's going to be Tuesday, August 27th from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, at room number 10 at, uh, at Iowa Community Center. Um, and then it's just some sad news that I wanted to pass along. Um, I was informed that um, Bill Franz from Calvary United Methodist Church had passed away suddenly. Um, Bill, um, many of you may know of him, but he was kind of uh, the one of the founding members for the uh, Love Your Neighbor Day, very integral part of uh, Calvary United Methodist Church. Uh, he did lots of uh, wonderful things there. He ran their potato drop, um, and he was he had retired from the EPA. He was a he managed their Upper Mississippi region. So uh, there'll be a service held for him uh, on Monday the 29th at Calvary United Methodist from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. There'll be visitation and, a, and then a, a program, uh, then, excuse me, then a, a, a service. And I just want to comment on Mr. Amore's, um, I appreciate his efforts with regards to PACE. I did speak briefly with Chris Rose from PACE she did comment that she's getting excellent feedback from the manager on the progress of the bridge, um, that they're, they're actually very anxious to go back to the old route for 313. Uh, she said that they estimate that up to 88 riders were displaced uh, because of the, the change in the route. Uh, and they're, she's very receptive, uh, or their planning department is very receptive to changes if it makes sense. And she did make some comments about the prior route that Joe had passed along, uh, and I passed that information to him as well. So, uh, you know, there may be an opportunity to change the route. You know, they they have to look at it, you know. So um, that's thank all you, I have. Thank had. you for doing that. Thank you. So, Trustee Tucker? Uh, nothing tonight. Trustee Murphy? Uh, just a shout out to Sandy Hill and the folks at the Villa Park Library for facilitating our cooling center, keeping all residents safe during our last little heat wave and extending their hours for us. Um, we really appreciate it and I'm sure some of our residents do as well. So a shout out to the library folks. That's all I have. Okay. And the only things I have, first off, our next meeting is uh, August 12th right here at 7 o'clock. And uh, also, you probably already noticed that the St. Charles, Charles Road Bridge over Salt Creek is going, is under construction. It's going to be down to one lane. So uh, plan your trips accordingly, because that's a nightmare when it was four lanes. So <laughs> it's going to be more of a nightmare now. Uh, the other thing I want to bring to the, uh, the village's attention is that we've started with the uh, 2020 uh, census. Uh, we had an initial meeting with uh, some representative from the census board and uh, we put together a, a, um, a committee of local like uh, library people school district people uh, <coughs> village people fire police uh, t so we have a little group together to help promote the census um, and just one of the big things they have right now if anybody's looking for a job part time part time full time the Census Bureau is in dire need of employees, and they pay between 18 and $23 an hour uh, for even part-time, and those are a number of positions, anywhere from a supervisor position down to uh, canvassers who uh, would actually go around the streets. They try to hire local people to, to work in our local community, and their main office in this area is in Oak Brook on 22nd Street. So if you go to uh, 2020census.gov slash jobs and all the uh, requirements for the uh, employment and what positions are available and the pay salary, pay salary is on there. And a uh, few requirements, uh, you know, you have to have a driver's license, you have to be 18. Uh, so if you're looking for anybody looking for part-time, full-time, um, they're, they're eager to uh, hire. So uh, just so you know, the census is coming up. It's in April. Um, and it's how important that, important that is to the village. We just heard from Kevin tonight 
federal monies that we had that he had to bring pick up on his his financial report was a 1.5 million uh, last year so and that all based on uh, census figures the schools need um, need uh, the numbers so they know how many kids are coming up into their system uh, in the next few years uh, they also need to know how many what the income levels are so they know if they have to plan on uh, uh, subsidized lunches and uh, also they get uh, money from the federal government too so not just the federal government but also the state uh, also uses uh, that information when they uh, work on grants so uh, there's a number of projects like Kevin with 1.5 million that uh, that information we got the village a lot of more sewer separation in certain areas of town so it's not just the number of people it's all the other information that comes with it and a lot of people you know are afraid to give that information out because it's going to leak somewhere but by uh, law uh, that information is not available any specific information on anybody is not available they can give you an idea on on um, income in certain communities but there's no information put out about uh, specific people so just want to bring that to your attention be ready for that they're already going around verifying some addresses they take a little some so many address percentage and they go walk around just to make sure that house is still there or that apartment building is still there they're doing that right now so that's the first thing that they started so but anybody's looking for a job yes Christy looking may for I a ask job? one more question oh, yeah okay. yes I am <laughs> anybody it doesn't have to be the Census Bureau <laughs> I'm flexible I do have one more question do we have any insight into the special hearing signs in front of the library and what they're doing with that the special hearing signs in front of the library and there's one in front of district 88 um, they want to have an electronic sign uh, both locations and our village code does not allow electronic signs even though the library already built their electronic signs mm -hmm. so <laughs> the uh, so they turned it off now but they have to come to the planning and zoning commission for a uh, request of variance so and that'll be at the next planning and zoning commission in august i believe it's the 8th so they'll be at the planning and zoning commission both locations for willowbrook and library electronic sign thank you okay yes next we'll move to the manager's report <laughs> thank you Ryan. i just have a couple items so folks and board uh, this Wednesday July 24th is the last concert in the park for Kiwanis it starts at 630 it's Lake Effect and that'll be the last one for this summer and then in August Cortese Veterans Memorial Park on Thursdays will have concerts and those can be found on our website or in our new Village Matters which was delivered to everyone's home in Villa Park when uh, either this week uh, was or delivered next, this week it could be <laughs> so I have mine uh, it's mine. a beauty um, <clears throat> also your honor and board I'd like uh, chief Ron to kind of give us uh, the background um, recently we sent a firefighter to Calhoun County in southern Illinois to help with some flood flooding and so chief Ron wants to kind of give us an update your honor. I understand other departments in the neighborhood here also sent people yeah, I'll give you a rundown. There you go. Um, Thank you. Do I have to sign in? Uh, no, you got to maintain. Okay, so uh, back at the June 27th Mavis meeting uh, that we that I attend. What's Mavis? On a, what's that? What's Mavis? I'm going to explain. Okay, sorry. So um, at the Mavis <laughs> meeting back on June 27th, it was brought to my attention that we may be sending um, our water rescue team down to Calhoun County. So Mavis, Mavis is the uh, mutual aid box alarm system similar to ILEAS, like the police have. There's 35,000 uh, firefighters from the state of Illinois in there in this association. I don't know how many departments. There's 69 different divisions. DuPage County is Division 12. So Division 12 was going to send uh, the water rescue team um, down to Calhoun County. Mavis also, what Mavis does for, du for us in DuPage County most departments can't afford to have specialty teams, water rescue, hazmat, or technical rescue. So each department um, has two or three people in their department in each different uh, um, specialty team. 
to, uh, to get a nice strong team um, to work in Division 12, which is DuPage County. But with the Mavis uh, agreements, when you're in Mavis, you may go anywhere in the state of Illinois, or in some cases, they went down to Katrina, down to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, and if we need help in, in, in Villa Park or DuPage County, we can get assets from neighboring divisions or neighboring towns. So in this case, um, Joe Leone, the chief of Addison, says we're probably going to be sending a team of four or five guys down to Calhoun County sometime next week. So later that day, maybe two or three hours later, he calls me and says we're going to be sending the team uh, Saturday, um, Saturday, uh, June 29th. And would anybody from Villa Park, we have three guys on the water rescue team, would anybody from Villa Park be interested in going? And I said, well, Lieutenant Jamie Bickley, I think, would like to go. He's been on the committee. He's a big water rescue uh, individual. So I called Jamie. I said, be prepared. You might be getting a phone call from uh, the president of uh, Mavis, Division 12, um, and he'll be asking if you can be, be gone for about a week down in Calhoun County. So he said, okay. He goes, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. So he gets back to me. He said he's good to go. I said, all right, you'll be taken off. Um, June 29th from Addison Station 71 on Addison Road, um, and you'll be gone a week to 10 days. Um, so he, he left on Saturday with a representative from Villa Park, him, Oak Brook, Winfield, uh, and Roselle, if I remember correctly. Those four different agencies sent a member down. And if you remember, uh, we took the uh, boats from Mavis Division 12, they're, at, they're stored at Station 81 down by Willowbrook High School. So they went down to uh, down in Calhoun County, uh, which is down by St. Louis. And it's, it's a peninsula, from what I'm told. And um, a levee broke. And I, I asked Jamie Bickley to write me uh, some bullet points. And I'd like to read those, what he wrote for me, um, and give you some idea of what, uh, what was involved. But he said it was very interesting. Um, so I'd like to read his bullet points, and then I'll take some questions if you have any. On June 29th, Mavis Division 12 deployed a boat team to Hardin, Illinois in Calhoun County. Calhoun County is a peninsula located in southern Illinois. It is bordered by the Mississippi River on the west and the Illinois River on the east. The area experienced an excessive amount of water this year from the rainy spring we had. In June, the levee on the Illinois side gave way, leaving a 200-yard gap, flooding thousands of acres of land closing roads and displacing residents. And the way he explained it to me was that there was 40 feet of water when before there was nothing. So the tops of trees looked like bushes and they were the tops of trees. In addition to the levee break, the Illinois River continued to rise and flooded Calhoun County, specifically the town of Hardin, Illinois. Hardin and all of other towns in the county depend on the ferries that service the county to allow travel on and off the peninsula. The ferries were forced to shut down due to the excessive flooding, leaving them without a timely fashion for emergency care. Mavis assets were requested to provide ALS service, ALS is advanced life support, in conjunction with boat crews. In the event of an EMS call, the patient would either be evacuated via helicopter, by ground ambulance, or by boat, depending on the location and the severity of the call. Both Division 41, which was Bloomington Normal, ALS Ambulance, and Division 12, Villa Park, Addison, Winfield, and Roselle. Uh, the boats were working together during our deployment. We focused, we, we were housed at a great school in the town of Hardin. And I'd like to just mention, in that school was the, the four or five members, and then also a dog that was uh, displaced. So he was with the guys, sleeping with the guys, and <laughs> eating with the guys, and so on and so forth. With the warm temperatures and good weather, the river dropped each day until the ferries opened up on Friday. Although there was months of work ahead of the area, our job was complete once the ferries were operational. In addition, the Division 12 boats provided recon missions each day to update the river conditions to the county, as well as assisted with three sinking barges in the river. The deployment ended on July 6th. So he was gone, I think, seven or eight days. Um, he had some interesting stories, but it was a great thing. Uh, when he was down at Villa Park, he, uh, he wore a Villa Park t-shirt. Uh, he he uh, 
Representative Villa Park very highly. Uh, a lot of nice comments for all the guys that were down there helping out those people that were stricken by the water. Um, so it was a feather in our cap, I believe, for the whole village of Villa Park, not just the fire department, but the village. And, uh, and I commend him for going and, and making us look good. So Great. with that, um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you. That's really uh, what it means to be a neighbor. You yeah. know, even though they're down in southern Illinois, they're still our neighbors. And uh, good, so, good thing we can help them it's out. It's nice to help out. So. You bet. And you never know. We might need it someday, too. Could so. be. Hope not. But. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that report. Anything else? No, Your Honor, with that, I pass. Okay. With that, we'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Let's see President, I'll make that motion. You have a second? Trustee Patrick? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, we're adjourned. We'll be back on the 22nd. <laughs>